mention, as Willa Mark speaks to us on the origins of Bible baptism. Good afternoon to you all. Also, a few young folks in the audience here, and I've promised Ben that I will try and be short and interesting instead of long and boring. <laughs> On the basis that maybe some of you want to have a listen because we've got some little quiz questions for you at the end, so you'll be good to know the answers. So uh, that's the deal, folks. Eh? <laughs> so, the origins of Bible baptism. We're going to explore this a little bit along these lines here. Um, we're firstly, see what the basics are for baptism. Can anybody be baptised? Just walking through the back here and ask to be baptised. Is, is that appropriate? What are the prerequisites, the things that must be done before baptism? We'll explore that. The, the other important one, of course, is why be baptised? What, what's the symbology behind it? We want to touch a little bit on infant christening, which a lot of people assume is the same as baptism. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say on that. And then we'll draw our thoughts together in a little summary and check if anybody was listening. Right? That's the plan. So, baptism itself, what does the word really mean? It's, it's an unusual word, baptism. And the English word baptism has essentially been stolen from the Greek. And so the Greek word for baptism is the word baptizo. So you can see it's, it's kind of been stolen from the Greek. And it means, it means there's, a, there's a whole sort of series of the possible renderings for it there, but it basically means to be made completely wet, to be made fully wet. That's what baptism is all about. We obviously need to understand the symbology behind it, but the word baptism means to be made fully wet. The, the word comes out of the people who would be um, changing the colour of cloth with dyeing it, D-Y-E, dyeing cloth. Uh, and and to, take, to take that, you need to get the liquid dye, you have to dunk the cloth in it and pull it out, and then it's, once it's been properly immersed, then it's totally changed as it comes out. That's the origin of the word. People get confused between baptism and sprinkling, and it's important to see, I mean, sprinkling is a Bible word, but it's used in a very different context. Sprinkling is uh, associated with the things that would have happened under the law of Moses, uh, with regard to animal sacrifices. A little passage there, you can see Hebrews 9. He sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. Uh, and you can see that there's the Greek word up there for sprinkling, which is the word rantizo. I probably pronounced that completely wrongly. But you can see that grammatically it has zero connection with the word baptism. There is, in, in, in Greek, there is a completely different word for baptize and for sprinkling. Uh, and so, if it's different words, it's meaning different things. Uh, that's why you have different words for it. So it's important to make sure that grammatically in the Greek, that even though in English these things have been blurred together, grammatically in the Greek they are totally different things. <coughs> and so let's look at some examples of baptism to do with why it needs to be made completely wet. Here is John the Baptist. He obviously knew a thing or two about baptism. Uh, and where did he go? John chapter 3 tells us that he was baptizing in a, a place called Enon near Salem because there was a lot of water, there was much water there, uh, and they came and were baptized. If he just needed to sprinkle the people with water, then any old little stream or a bucket could have been used for that. Uh, but no, John the Baptist chose this place near the River Jordan because there was a lot of water there, so he could immerse people. That's the logic behind it. And that's why we have that little passage in Acts chapter 8 read, to show again that it needs an immersion in water. In, in, in that little incident in Acts chapter 8, Philip takes the man from Ethiopia, he asks to be baptised, and then he, they, they go down, but he says there in the language, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Philip and the eunuch, he baptised him, and when they were come up out of the water, you see they've been in, and out of the water to baptise him. Again, if it was just sprinkling, I'm sure they'd have had a little flask of water in the chariot. He need not even have stopped the chariot. He could have got a little bottle of water, sprinkled a bit on him, and they could have carried on. But no, they had to stop the chariot, go into the water, come up out of the water. So in Bible language, this isn't complicated at all. Bible language, baptism means immersion. It's quite clear. That's what the word means. That's what they did. So if you want to follow the Bible, 
That's what baptism is all about. Right? Very simple. And, and let's have a look at some early examples of this. This is something that's been dug up in a place in Corsica where they were excavating an old church. Uh, this goes back to way, 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 long, long, long ago, just a few hundred years after the Lord Jesus Christ had been on this earth. And as they were digging around in the footings of this old church, they found this. You can see that little symbol there. And to give you the dimensions, it's just over two meters by just over one meter by about a meter deep. This is a very, very early Christian baptism bath. It's been found, it's been dug up, it's archaeological evidence that what they did was immerse people in water. And there's not just one of these, there's lots of them. This is from another uh, fourth century church in, in, in Jordan. And again, you can see the dimensions of it are very similar. This is a bath that was designed for immersing people, not for sprinkling people. And here's another one again. And this one's in Tunisia, a much more elaborate, fancily decorated one, this one here. But it's, uh, it's designed for full immersion. It's got four steps going down into it and four steps coming back out of it. So again, this is what baptism word means. It means to immerse. That's what they did. And this is now archaeological evidence to show that this is what people were actually doing. These are early baptism baths from donkeys years ago. Right? So that's quite clear, isn't it? So who can be baptised? And when is it appropriate to baptise somebody? Well, we actually had a clue in that short reading that we read. Because in that reading, Philip and the Ethiopian, they met on this journey through the, through the desert. And in verse 36, it tells us, as they went on their way, they came to some water. And the eunuch says, see, here is water. What's stopping me from being baptised? And Philip didn't just suddenly say, come on, out of the chariot, let's jump in and I'll immerse you. He asks the question. Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. So there's a question here about belief. And if that eunuch had said, yeah, I want to be baptised, but I don't believe in about God or anything like that, I'm absolutely sure Philip would not have immersed him. And so there's a question here about belief. So Philip challenges him, do you believe? And, and there is a confession of belief. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so here, there's a confession of belief, and after he's answered correctly, then he is immersed. And so there's a question, therefore, that before you can be baptised, belief is fundamental to doing that. Otherwise, you might just as well go and have a bath. There's no meaning to it. And we'll see the symbology in a bit. Belief is a, is a precursor to baptism. Now, there's another precursor again. This time, it's the word repentance. If we come back a little bit in Acts to Acts chapter 2, we've got uh, the end of the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified, he's been raised back to life again, uh, and then after a short while he's ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1 to be with his Father, leaving behind his disciples to talk to the crowds. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter talks to the crowds, who were a bit hostile to start with, and he calms them all down and gets them to listen, and he explains to them, you Jews, 50 days ago, were shouting for Jesus to be crucified. And he explains to them, he's now alive and he's sitting at the right hand of God. And it suddenly dawned on these Jews that they had crucified the Son of God. And they say this, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what can we do? We've crucified the Son of God. Now, all sin is wrong, they say all coal is black, but as sins go, crucifying the Son of God has got to be up at the top of the list. And so they realise that they've killed the Son of God. What can they do? And Peter says, okay, repent. Admit what you've done is wrong. Confess your sins to God, that's what repentance means. And be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. So notice the sequence again, repent and be baptised. So before baptism, belief is important and repentance is important. Then baptism starts to have some meaning. Okay, and, and the meaning is all to do with washing. Now we'll, we'll, we'll pick up another little bit on this theme of washing. Uh, we're all fairly clean here today, we're all in our, 
their Sunday attire, we're all very clean. But God doesn't look on the outside, he looks on the heart. And he wants to know what your heart and mind is like. Is that clean or is that dirty? And the truth of the matter is, for all of us, it's a bit grubby. And so part of the idea of repentance is that there is a washing away of sins. And that's what Acts chapter 22 speaks about. Another occasion where somebody wanted to be baptised, uh, and, and the statement is, what, what are you waiting for? Why tarryest thou? Arise, be baptised, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So baptism is a washing away of sins. And we often think that baptism is simply a New Testament topic. And, and actually it is in a way, because well, we began by saying it was a Greek word, didn't we? And the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. So actually you wouldn't expect to find the word baptism in, in the Old Testament, because it's the wrong language. <laughs> it should have been in Greek, that's why it's in the New Testament. But the principle of washing very much is there in the Old Testament. It's not called baptism, because it's the wrong language, but the symbology is there. Uh, and when you look at a passage like Acts chapter 30 under the law of Moses, with the rituals that they had to do there for the priests and the dedication, and we're told in Exodus 30 and verse 20, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering, made by fire unto the Lord. So the priests on duty had to wash. There was a practical side to it, because I'm sure when they were sacrificing animals, that would have been a bit messy. But there was a spiritual dimension to that as well, which was a washing of their sins to, to try and appear clean as character before God. And so although it's not referred to as being baptism, essentially that's what it is, in symbol and in uh, the, the, the actual physical aspect. Uh, and you can see here on, on the screen now, there is another picture you might say, hey, is this another, another early uh, first, second, third, fourth century AD baptism and bath? And the answer is no, it's not. It's actually a Jewish immersion pool. You've probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written out by a bunch of Jews called the Essenes. Uh, and they were up in the Dead Sea, up in the caves up there. And they, they were a Jewish community, half following the law, half trying to follow the, the, the extra regulations that they'd made. But they were following Jewish practices. They, they couldn't worship at the tabernacle, in the, the tabernacle wasn't there, and the, the temple was, was, was largely over in Jerusalem. But what they did is they followed a lot of the customs. And they carried out Jewish immersion and washing for cleansing. And so what looks like an early Christian baptism bath is not. It's actually a Jewish immersion pool at Qumran. So the origins of Bible baptism are way, way, way back in the Old Testament. They go right back to Adam and Eve who sinned in the garden where they needed their sins to be covered over, taken away. And the law of Moses came and instituted this symbol of washing. That's a, that's a really interesting passage which you could spend all night on. It's a really good meaty one to digest in Romans chapter 6. But it talks in this passage of Romans chapter 6 about a parallel between the Lord Jesus Christ who, who lived his life, who died, was in the tomb for three days, and rose again to a new way of life, to be with his Father in heaven. Obviously we believe he'll come back again and establish the kingdom. But that's paralleled with us for baptism. We live our lives now, and then we decide, there comes a point in our life where we decide that we, we want to be baptised. We want to no longer serve ourselves and serve pleasure, but we want to serve God. And at that point, we, we, we as it were, kill our old way of life. We go through the waters of baptism, wash away our sins, and we come out of the other side as servants to the Lord Jesus Christ now. We are born again to a new way of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's paralleled with the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the beginning of a new life serving him. <clears throat> well, let's talk about infant christening for a short while, shall we? And this is a practice that's uh, common in the churches around us. I think this last week uh, or the week before, the Queen went to see some more of her new offspring that had just been produced recently, to see them allegedly, according to the news, baptised. Actually, they were christened, and, and this little font that's used there that you can see was used to uh, christen, to sprinkle water on the first of Queen Victoria's many children, and is still used to this day by the royal family. And the, and, and the press will confuse the words of baptism and christening. They just mix it up and think it's the same thing. 
we've already seen that they're different words with fundamentally different meanings. But nonetheless, that's what's, that's what's done by the churches around us. When you say to them, well, why are you, why, why are you sprinkling water on infants? What's the purpose between that? And they say, well, it was done in the Bible. Say, okay, interesting, show me. And you get a couple of passages like this shown before you. So let's look at it. This is evidence that they were put before you to say it's okay to immerse a baby or to sprinkle a baby. And so in Acts chapter 16, we're told that there was a lady, a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. She heard Paul and colleagues speaking about the gospel, whose heart the Lord opened and she, she attended. She listened unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her households, she besought us saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay with me. So there, the, the argument hangs on those words that Lydia was baptised and her household. So they say, aha, there you go, it's all the children in the family, all the babies in the family. The whole household was baptised, so you could baptise babies. Well, hang on a minute, Let, let's use a bit of logic here. Does it say babies? No. So it's an assumption that household means and includes babies. It, it could do, but it doesn't have to. The word household could mean many things in many senses. It could be that, <coughs> me. It could be that as she was a, a businesswoman, might have been a family business, might have been brothers or sisters or cousins were in the family or her or her parents, or it might even have been servants in the family. That household means those who were in the house. And, and so it could have been servants and, and relatives who were mature as well. Could mean either. You can't prove it either way if the truth's told from that, but you certainly can't use that to prove <clears throat> that that's babies because the word could have included something else. Here, here's another one where Paul goes around and he says, well, I've been baptising, and he says, I baptised into the household of Stephanas. Besides that, I know not whether I baptised any others. And so again, you get this phrase, households being baptised. What does that mean? Could mean children. But it could mean relatives or servants. You cannot, though, use it to prove children because that's why we spent a bit of time talking about the prerequisites for baptism. For baptism, for Bible baptism to mean anything, you must believe. You must repent of your sins. And so to argue that this therefore means that babies can be baptised, how's a baby going to believe anything? It's not got the the intellectual maturity at a few day olds to do anything. It's hardly even committed many sins to repent of. It's meaningless. And so you cannot use that to prove, uh, and there is no other examples in scripture about babies being, this is an assumption, and the assumption is flawed, is what we're arguing here. <clears throat> so where did christening come from? Who made that up? If, if baptism is what the Bible <coughs> speaks about, and you can look at some ye olde records. Here's the one from the Didache or the Didac, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. About the year 100. <coughs> and in that very, very old text, it speaks of the baptism of adults, that's good, rather than young children. Since it requires the person to be baptized should fast. Hang on a minute. What's that about? What's the symbology of that? There's nothing in the Bible about fasting. No requirement anywhere in the Bible. Yes, for adults rather than young children, but there's no Bible instruction to say that you must fast before. So they're making some of this up. And this is only a, a, some, some, something like 70 years after John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and they're changing it. But then the, this, this document then says, if the water is insufficient for immersion, it may be poured three times on the head. Well, you've got a problem if there's not enough water there, but. Frankly, you can do what you want to do. There are plenty of places in Africa that are very dry, and today there are people who want to be baptised. You can always find enough water if you try hard enough. Whether it's down a well or whatever it is, there are ways of doing it, and it is done. For those who want to be obedient, you can do it. So back to the old adage, you can do what you want to do. If it really means something to you, you'll find a way to do it. And then there's some other old writings, one from Irenaeus, uh, another, another sort of 80 odd years on, 
It, by then, by the AD 200, it speaks not only of children, but even of infants, and by that I assume babies, being born again to God. And then in Oregon, same time period, about 200 years after Christ, it mentions that infant baptism is traditional and customary. So while those early baptism baths that we looked at earlier were true immersion pools, although some people were following that path, it seems that there's another group of people who were going a different direction, where they're making their own rules up here, which are not found in the Bible. Um, and they're changing the traditions, they're changing the requirements that are there in Scripture. And then Tertullian, uh, about the year AD 230, he advises postponing baptism till after marriage. Why? What happens if you don't want to get married? Does that mean you don't, can't be baptised? That doesn't make sense, does it? There's nothing in the Bible about that at all. So you see here, within a couple of hundred years of the Lord Jesus Christ living and teaching on this earth, people have changed Bible teaching. Christendom has gone astray from that which the Bible has spoken of, and that's dangerous. God says, do this. Man says, okay, yeah, but I'll do something different because I want to. That's a dangerous road to tread, a very dangerous road. Well, why would they even look at doing this? I mean, there are some issues here about a little child that might die early if it was a, a not a healthy one. But the apostles, though, have clearly taught full immersion. And it seems that the early church changed this teaching. The early uh, believers in the Ecclesia, uh, there, there was a mixture, partly of Greeks and partly of Jews. The Jews were trying to go back to the law of Moses. The Greeks on some occasions were trying to go back to their Greek teachings. And there was a danger that Chris, true Christianity, the true followers of Christ, would get their doctrine watered down either by following the way of the Greeks or following the way of the Jews. And it seems that the, this could have been a concept that's wrongly taking the idea of circumcising men, children, men, boys on the, on the, uh, the age of the eighth day. And therefore, therefore it's okay to sprinkle water on them the eighth day instead as, as, the, uh, as the new way of doing things. There is no logic equated between circumcising a man-child on the eighth day and sprinkling a baby. The only similarity is that man's mixing things up and confusing it. It is no connection at all with New Testament baptism. And so the big, big lesson here that comes out is that under the law of Moses, Anybody who tried to change the law of Moses, to try and change when God says, I want to do this, a man says, yeah, but I'm going to do something different. That was punished very severely. God took and demonstrated his dislike in very clear and very obvious and sometimes very dramatic ways. We're not punished instantly in this day and age if we decide to uh, go a different way. But there is a judgment coming on this earth where the Lord Jesus Christ will come and will carry out a judgment. Uh, and so it's not up to us to go around inventing changes and changes to Bible teaching. What God has spoken in the scriptures is very, very clear indeed. And so the summary is very clear. This is not a complicated topic. The summary is very clear. Baptism involves the immersion of a mature adult <coughs> because you need belief and repentance. The age of maturity is something that's going to vary from person to person, but it's got to be somebody who is cognizant of the fact that they are committing their life to serving the Lord Jesus Christ from then on. Once you've been baptised, you can't exactly be unbaptised. And so once you're committing your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to be of a maturity to recognise that's a significant, significant decision in your life, that you really want to do it. And, and so that's the important thing, immersion of a mature adult. We've seen that baptism symbolises a new start, a washing away of sins, a death and a resurrection with the Lord Jesus and starting a new life, serving him. And we've seen very clearly that christening is not baptism. They are different words and we've shared the warning of men inventing rules which are not in scripture. That is a very dangerous practice to follow. So this is not a complicated subject. That's the suggestions that we put before you for baptism. And so therefore we have a few little questions to see if anybody was actually listening. Firstly, uh, I'm not going to ask anybody to shout out because it's all very embarrassing. I'd like to wave your hands 
when you think you've got the right answer on the screen. So, listening up, kids. All right, you're all, all awake, still awake with us, are you? What is baptism? Number one, is it sprinkling a baby? It's looking promising. Good, no hands up. Is it nothing really? You just need Jesus to come into your heart. Is that good enough? No, that's good. Is it the Holy Spirit coming into your life? No. Is it immersing a believing adult in water? Oh, we've got lots of hands waving. That's looking good. Somebody must have been listening. Well done. You've listened to the Word of God. That's what we like. Why can't a baby be baptised? Would it cry if the water's too cold? Well, it probably would. <laughs> it might drown the baby. No. A baby cannot believe in God. Is that why you can't? Uh, yes, that's looking promising. Good. That's why a baby can't be baptised. It just makes no sense, does it? Can't believe in anything. do not know anything yet. What is important to know before baptism? Is it important to brush your hair and wear a suit? I haven't got very much hair, so that wouldn't do, would it? <laughs> is it important to believe the New Testament, but you don't have to really worry about the Old Testament? That's just a bunch of fairy stories. Uh, is it important to believe in God and to repent of your sins? Excellent. Very good. Top of the class. 10 out of 10. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good to share the Bible topics with you this afternoon. Thank you.